real bursts of speculation in the market. You know that it, it does get corrected eventually. Ben Graham was right when he said that in the in the in the short run it's a voting machine, in the long run it's a weighing machine. Sooner or later, the amount of cash that a business can disgorge in the future governs the value it has uh, that the stock commands in the market. But it can take a long time. And um, I mean, it's a very interesting proposition. For example, if you take a company that in the end never makes any money, but the trade changes hands representing a valuation of 10 or 20 billion dollars uh, for some time, uh, there's no wealth created. There's a tremendous amount of wealth transferred. Uh, and I think you will see when we look back on this era, you will see this as a period of enormous amounts of wealth transfer. But in the end, the only wealth creation comes about through what the business creates. There's no there's no magic to it. Well, I think the reason we use the phrase wretched excess is that there are wretched consequences. Uh, if you mix the mathematics of the chain letter or the Ponzi scheme with some legitimate development like the development of the internet, you are mixing something which is wretched and irrational and has bad consequences with something that uh, has very good consequences. But you know, if you mix raisins with turds, they're still turds. Uh, and, and I think, I think you, you will see, see when, when we, we look, look back, back on this era, era you, you will see, see this as, as a period of enormous, enormous amounts of wealth transfer. transfer. Today is Sunday, the 24th of November. This is a recap for the stock market activities for the week that was and an outlook for the week to come. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. Happy Thanksgiving week, everybody, which is probably going to make the stock market really slow this week. With the path of least resistance is higher, that's the assumption, of course, we'll see what happens, but a lot of you are not going to be trading next week, so we might not talk until after Thanksgiving, so let's just say happy Thanksgiving in advance. And oh, by the way, a little cheaper to feast on a Thanksgiving meal this year. Just a little tick down. And of course, they want to gaslight us about a little tick in the average cost of a class classic. I was about to say classy, but it is classic. Just a basic Thanksgiving meal. Uh, oh, now we got to give thanks to the government for uh, lowering the cost of a Thanksgiving meal, really. You moved it higher and then you give me a little tick down. I'm supposed to be thankful. Anyways, at least we can be thankful the turkeys. A down 6% year on year. Pumpkin pie mix, that's down 6.5. You got frozen peas, down 8.1%. Look at that, sweet potato. That's my favorite. That's down 26.2%. And that's going to make uh, uh, cooking the Al Roker sweet potato casserole easier this year. But of course, they get you with the cranberries, up 11.8%. Then you got uh, dinner rolls, up 8.4%. Uh, Stuffing. Yeah, the turkey's cheaper, but... <laughs> The stuffing is up 8.2%. Enjoy, at least while it lasts, because uh, next year with the tariffs and all of that, we're probably going to see inflation coming back again. But you know what the top concern in mind when it comes to this Thanksgiving dinner? It ain't the cost. It's the conversation. Because it was an election year, and of course your father-in-law has to gaslight you about the elections and rub it in your face and all of that. We don't want to talk politics, folks. But if somebody does, in your Thanksgiving uh, dinner, I got a good strategy for you to deflect the conversation uh, and change it to something more interesting. And my strategy is if somebody starts talking politics, I'm going to cut them off and say, Hey, Fox, what do you think about uh, th that Jay Leno thing? He roughed up half of his face and he says that uh, I went to the Hampton Inn and I didn't have a car. So I, I walked down a couple of stairs and I fell down and broke half of my face. And it just doesn't add up. If you fall down a couple of stairs, you're probably going to roll over. You hit all of your face, not half of your face. And Jay Leno doesn't have a car? Really? 
Staying at the Hamptons Inn? What's going on here? Anyways, let's uh, dive into business here, folks, because we got a good conversation for you. We're going to look at the sources of hope and the sources of fear in the upcoming period of the stock market. We begin with the wall of hope. Now, this is the wall of hope pre the elections. We had the hope of rate cuts. We continue to cut rates and things ease. And we have more manias. We also had the hope of AI, that AI is going to fix it all. And as we see the development of AI, the valuations in the stock market will continue to expand. And nothing bad will ever happen again. But we got a new wall of hope for you because uh, the whole uh, prospects of rate cuts, that already changed. We have probably seen the last rate cut for a period of time. We'll talk about that in a minute. But as far as AI... This week we got NVIDIA's earnings and they probably show that the AI optimism is probably pretty much maxed out at this point. But rest assured, we might have lost two sources of optimism, but we got two new sources. Number one is orange optimism. And this is, of course, all of the speculation about the upcoming administration's policies that they're going to be good for Bitcoin and good for industrials. They're going to deregulate banks and let's pump all of these higher and higher and higher. All of these stacks higher. Uh, cryptos are based on that optimism that what the upcoming administration will be good for. And we already see that in the stock market right now. Maybe it got a little excessive, but until we have something that negates that optimism, I think it's going to still be intact. The other source of optimism is Santa Claus, the seasonality. Or at the end of the year, Q4 is usually pretty good. There is no incentive to sell because nobody wants to pay taxes right now. We're only going to sell if there is something that forces the market to sell. Something uh, really horrific, which of course will lead us to the wall of worry. We'll see which one is more realistic. But absent of that, the seasonality is intact for now. And with it, of course, nobody wants to sell. Others waiting in the sidelines want to chase whatever left in this rally all the way till the year ends. So the dynamic is usually positive in the fourth quarter of the year. The problem is, once again, what if we have an event that forces uh, selling the stock market, be it by year end or after, once we have a new president inaugurated? And this is what used to be the wall of worry. We had the policy risk. We had the election risk, geopolitics, China, and the Fed policy, and the Japanese yen slash the Bank of Japan. Here is the updated wall of worry. We still have the policy risk. We don't have an election risk anymore. We got the trade war risk and the tariffs, of course, from the new administration. We still haven't resolved the geopolitical fears. And uh, since we talked about the trade war, which includes China, now becoming more than ever a source of worry is the bubble that we have in the market right now. What if we begin to take some air out of that bubble? And we talked about the heaviest weighted market cap stocks, the big cap technology stocks, the NVIDIAs of the world, the chips, the AI mania. What if they begin to take air out of that bubble? How would that impact the indices? And then, of course, we still have the Federal Reserve policy risk that if they change their mind and stop cutting rates, that could be a negative. And of course, the Bank of Japan, Japanese yen, that's still here. Let's talk about them one by one. If we begin with the policy risk, it starts to formulate once we have chaos and uncertainty. And we know that this administration will give us plenty of chaos and uncertainty. It's an unorthodox administration, so they're going to pick, of course, uh, kind of cabinet picks that other candidates, other presidents would have never thought of. And because of that, we have risk that some of these nominees might not make it, either before or during the confirmation process. And we already have one casualty, Matt Gates, The nominee for AG, down goes Matt Gates. Oh, Gates, whatever the hell his name is. But we do have uh, more cabinet positions that were filled since last week. So we have plenty of updates. We have uh, Linda McMahon for education. We have uh, NATO. We have uh, housing, CDC, FDA. But of course, certain cabinet positions are more important than others when it comes to the economy and the stock market. When we talk about the AG, which we have a replacement now. Pam Bondi will replace Matt Gates. Probably going to get confirmed. So the question now becomes, what does she think about this? Because this week we got Alphabet, Google going down big. And the reason is that DOJ is pushing Google to divest from uh, the Chrome search engine. They control about 70% of the market that's considered as a monopoly. Will the new AG double down on this policy, move away from this policy, ease it? All of that is going to cause a lot of speculation. My two cents, this administration is not going to be favorable for Google. They, they don't look at Google as something that, that is good. They see that Google sabotaged or tried to sabotage the Trump campaign, and they're probably going to drop the hammer. 
So this is a risk when we talk about the big caps and the weighting on the indices. If we continue to see harsher policies from the DOJ and perhaps the FTC, we might see these stocks suffering because they're losing a lot of appeal. The regulatory risk, the tariffs risk, all of these are risks on these giant companies that are inflated in valuation right now. What happens if the money comes out? Now, I think the second casualty before the confirmation process will be defense nominee Pete from Fox News. That's not going to happen. We told you that ahead of time. He's probably going to come out and say, oh, I talked to my family and my wife said blah, 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 right? and get out. Because now we're getting the news that the Trump administration is blindsided by the assault allegations against Pete from Fox News. Now, this position has a lot of impact on defense spending, and defense spending is huge, so this has an impact in the bond market and yields. What are the views and the position of the defense secretary when it comes to more defense spending? That, of course, has an economic impact and a market impact. But who's going to be the replacement of Pete from Fox News? My two cents? I think it's going to be, since this administration is so unorthodox, I think it might be Hulk Hogan, the new defense secretary. Let's nuke the whole world, brother. Anyways, other important uh, nominees, FDA. We got the FDA, Dr. Martin Malarkey, chosen to head the FDA. And again, they made a good piece here in the New York Times. You can uh, read it for yourself. But in, in summary, of course, he has the same alignment of views with the RFK Jr., and this is impacting healthcare stocks negatively. Now, I would say that some of the drops that we've seen in healthcare are opportunities to buy because the main concern for big pharmaceutical companies is the pricing. If they're not going to tackle the pricing, then nothing else matters. You can talk about vaccines, you can talk about uh, deregulations or regulations, whatever. All of that is going to be minor if there is no price reduction policy from the administration. Now, of course, certain names that are pure vaccine makers, like Moderna, for example, that's going to be more impacted than others. But I think some of the, the steep drops that we got in big pharmaceutical companies this week and the week prior are just not justified, and they offer values and opportunities to buy. And we did some of that. We'll talk about that in the strategy segment of this show. But perhaps the most important pick from an economic perspective, from a market perspective, is the Treasury Secretary, which is right now Janet Yellen. And Janet Yellen has been nothing but a disaster. Uh, she costs us trillions and trillions of dollars in debt just to manipulate the stock market. Now we have the new nominee, Scott Besson. Uh, surprise, he's a Wall Streeter. So if you thought this administration is going to be on the side of... Uh, you know, Main Street and uh, middle class folks, forget about it. And this is the gentleman in question here, Scott Besson, chief executive in Square Group. I'm pretty sure he's going to try to benefit his buddies, but uh, let's read here a little bit on his views. Like Trump, Besson favors gradual tariffs and deregulation to push American business to control inflation. In addition, he has advocated for a revival in manufacturing as well as energy independence. Well, good luck reviving manufacturing, because that's on a free fall. And as far as uh, deregulations and tariffs at the same time to control inflation, uh, that just doesn't add up. Tariffs are inflationary by nature. Uh, I agree that some tariffs should be placed, but again, you cannot deny that they have an inflationary impact. One obstacle Besant will have to overcome is his past affiliation with billionaire investor and global progressive gadfly George Soros. Uh-oh. He served as chief investment officer for Soros Fund. Whoops. Uh, Trump, though, said Besant will support my policies that will drive U.S. competitiveness and stop unfair trade imbalances. We'll see. It's an important position. Uh, I'd like to hear more. What is he going to do when it comes to the bond market? Continue the inflation policy of Janet Yellen or save the country? Of course, there's a cost to save the country. And of course, it's the same thing when we talk about the uh, new Doge Commission. I think it's a gimmick, to be honest with you right now, especially when you have uh, uh, two freeloaders on government money leading it. I mean, Elon Musk, he built his empire by government handouts. In uh, Vivek, didn't he do a pump and dump scheme in uh, biotech stock? That's how he got rich? I don't know. But anyways, it says here that Musk and Ramos Maui lay out a brutal plan for American austerity. Uh-oh, I told you you're going to hear that term sooner than later. Austerity, something we're not used to. Now, here's the thing. You can cut $200 million of wasteful spending. That's not going to do shit. Unless you tackle the three big ones. Defense, Social Security, and Medicare. You're not going to really reduce the deficit. Does anybody have the courage to tackle any of these three? Of course not. You cut defense, now you're accused of being a traitor. At Social Security, you're going to hurt yourself with the constituents. You cut Medicare, it's the same thing. 
So where will the cutting come from to balance the budget? And oh, by the way, when we talk about the big three, we actually have the big four. Because we're not right now paying more in interest payments per year, over a trillion dollars, than the entirety of the defense budget. So that's the number one monster that has to be tackled down. Folks would argue that, oh, if the Fed just cuts rates, that's going to do it. Well, they cut rates, and rates went higher, because we have an inflation risk. And as we see more and more inflationary policies and more and more mistakes by the Federal Reserve, rates will continue to go higher. And at some point, we'll be paying $1.3, $1.5 trillion in interest payments alone per year, if not even $2 trillion. I think this is a massive bomb that nobody's talking about right now. I mean, in the market, nobody's talking about. Yeah, real folks who care about the economy, they've been talking about it for a long time. But the market right now is not worried about this. It continues to ignore this subject, but is now having a tangible impact on the economy. And it's having a tangible impact on the bond market. And this is why it will not be ignored for too long. Keep that in mind. Now, another cause of volatility that could be coming. You know, I said this and I predict that the bromance between Trump and Elon Musk is not going to last. Uh, two giant egos cannot coexist together. And I think at some point he's just going to have enough with the dorkiness of Elon Musk, and he's going to call him a dog. He didn't want to leave Mar-a-Lago. We had to drag him out like a dog. And don't forget that uh, uh, Donald Trump in the first administration or first term, he actually hit Elon Musk really hard. I mean, these are just, this is just a little sample for you uh, on the tweets that he did against Elon Musk. And I think we would see this bromance frizzling out. Now the question becomes, what is the impact on Tesla stock? What is the impact on the X and all of that. I don't think it's going to happen right now, though. It's going to take time. That leads us to the second element of the wall of worry, the trade war. That's inevitable. That's going to happen. It's probably going to be the first course of action by this administration comes January. But we just got the data from China. The trade deficit is expanding. Uh, the Chinese, of course, trying to export as much as they can before the tariffs hit. And this is why we see Q4 export jumping e enormously from the data that we got from China this week. Of course, He's looking at this right now and he's pissed off. The moment he becomes president, the tariffs will be enacted right away because this cannot continue, at least from the perspective of uh, the uh, Trumponomics. And we all know that right now we're looking at the glass half full of the Trump administration, that he's going to be good for this and good for that and the tax cuts and all of that. But the moment we begin or get closer to the conversation about tariffs, the market, the economy, everybody will begin looking at the glass half empty and the fears of an escalation in the trade war. China is already armed, ready for the trade war 2.0 with Trump. And I think this time around, the Chinese learned a lesson from the first administration of Donald Trump. And they're going to be aggressive this time around in fighting back, which will have a tangible impact against American companies. What if China just says, you know what? We're just going to ban Apple from uh, selling phones in the country altogether. We don't need it anymore. We have a new uh, chip from Huawei. And uh, it's already taken over the market share of Apple in China. Might as well just get rid of the entire company out of the country. We've used all of the information that we could steal from Apple, and now we do a better job than they do. What do you think the impact on Apple would be if that happens? So this trade war, this episode of the trade war, could be really, really nasty. Furthermore, this week we got earnings from Walmart. And anybody who thinks that the tariffs are not going to have an inflation impact in the economy, you got to think again. The companies are saying, if we get tariffs from goods coming out of China, we will pass the extra cost down to the consumer. This is what Elf Beauty executives said. This is what Walmart executives said. And many more companies, as they report, and they're asked about the tariff policy. All of them are saying, we're going to pass the extra cost down to the consumer. What do you think will happen when we have higher inflation? What's going to happen in the bond market? Yields are going to go higher. What's going to happen to the interest payment that the country has to pay every quarter, every year, which is right now over a trillion dollars? What do you think will happen when rates go higher in the bond market and we have an extremely overvalued stock market? Why assume the risk when you have higher yields on the risk-free bonds? A lot of implications, but right now, nobody's paying attention yet. Keyword, yet. The third item of the wall of worry. What about the geopolitics? Did we eliminate that? Of course not. I think it's going to flare up as the new administration takes over. And I think that there are certain players who are trying really hard to lock this administration into a reality before they take office. Be it the deep state, be it Ukraine, be it NATO, be it Iran, be it Israel, who knows. But this new escalation that we've seen recently, uh, allowing Ukraine uh, to shoot missiles 
made here deep into Russian territory. I think they're trying to lock this administration into a newer reality. That once they take office, they cannot really go with the uh, peace endeavors and let's end the war and all of that. Because things are already flaring up and you're just forced into a certain reality. And that could happen in the Middle Eastern Front too. Listen to this headline. This is today, by the way. Iran is preparing to respond. The Israel says advisor to the Supreme Court. This came out today. That, hey, Iran did not forget about the reta Israeli retaliation. And now we're going to do the retaliation of the retaliation. Of the other retaliation. I'm going to leave it to you, political experts, to think about this. Is it to the advantage of Iran that they retaliate against Israel before Trump takes office or after? Such as, do it now, you force the new administration into a reality. But you're probably going to feel the wrath of that administration because uh, they're surrounded by Iran hawks. Do it after, what would be the benefit of waiting? So again, we're all in pins and needles because this could happen again. And as we see retaliation after retaliation, they get more serious. And at some point, the Israelis might have the permission from the new administration to strike the nuclear and the oil facilities in Iran. So that front is not over. I mean, even today, Hezbollah just bombed the living hell out of Israel, 250 rockets. So things are not cooling off. And of course, this is typical behavior of escalating to force this administration into a new reality. But this administration is erratic, and they might take extreme measures against this reality. Keep that in mind. So when we talk about Russia, Ukraine, we know that we have an escalation. They're hitting Russia deep with NATO missiles. And the Russians say this is an attack by all. It's not just an attack by Ukraine. All of these countries are responsible, including the United States. They altered the nuclear doctrine, initiated a new attack using a new missile that remains a mystery. But we're all seeing the speed. It's a missile that is capable of carrying a nuclear load. What happens, say, the UK keeps poking, 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 thinking that, oh, the worst case scenario happened, we're just going to hide behind the Americans. I mean, you got to think about it. This is the size of the UK. I mean, sometimes they think that they're a big empire, but it's just a tiny little island. What if Putin decides, you know what, I want to make an example here. They've been saying I'm bluffing, I'm not doing anything. Maybe I got to force the new administration into a reality. Now, hitting UK, that's an extreme scenario. But I'm just illustrating for you uh, the dynamic that we see in Europe right now. But they're probably going to strike Ukraine if they're going to use a nuclear weapon to force the new administration into a reality. And that's probably not going to happen without another deep and devastating strike by Ukraine into Russia. So for now, it's a game. It's a very dangerous game. It's called posturing, where everybody's trying to force the new administration into a reality by escalating. But this escalation could get out of hand before they take office. Implications in the market, of course, defense spending and oil and a lot of other commodities. Now we segue to the uh, newest item of the wall of worry. This is really important and probably the main topic of today's discussion. We talk about the bubbles. We know that we have an AI bubble going on right now and we have seen extremes. The poster boy, of course, is NVIDIA. We're talking about a company right now valued at three and a half trillion dollars. More valuable than Apple even though NVIDIA makes a fraction of the revenue that Apple produces. And the sustainability of that revenue expansion is under question. At some point, it's going to slow down. There's no doubt about it. So the Wall Street Journal says NVIDIA is on top, but does it have anywhere to go but down? Question mark. And the short answer is no. It doesn't have anywhere to go but down. It can rebound next week because of the seasonality and the low trading volume and all of that. But at the end of the day, you look at it from a fundamental perspective. The year-on-year -year revenue growth already tapped out. The law of large numbers, you can't really produce the same numbers anymore. So you can't expand the valuation anymore. You look at the sequential growth. We went down to 7% in the latest report. And the quarter after that, we're probably going to go down to 5, 4. At some point, we're going to go negative. And that's going to be the moment when NVIDIA pops in a big way. Of course, the market is going to sniff that ahead of time. It's not going to wait for the report to come out before it does the move. And the question now becomes, I mean, you've, you guys seen what happened on Friday's session. The rest of the market was doing pretty good. The equal weight S&P was doing pretty good. The Dow Jones was doing pretty good. The Russell 2000 doing pretty good. But NVIDIA was down 3 to 4%. And the indices, the S&P and the NASDAQ were flattish, even though the rest of the market went higher. But because of the weight of NVIDIA going down 3 to 4%, it keeps the index flat. Now think about a scenario where we see NVIDIA down 20% in the quarter and the rest of the market not participating. It's going to hammer the indices big time. And right now, we are amidst an economy that is heavily dependent. It's actually holding right now for this reason alone. 
the wealth effect coming from the stock market. The people look at the retirement accounts and they feel pretty good and they start spending in the economy. But if you're going to hammer the big caps, we talked about Google, of course. Soon enough, we're going to talk about Apple and the trade war. Soon enough, we'll talk about Meta, even though Zucchini is begging like a dog to be included in the uh, Trump circle, but he's not uh, getting any invitation yet. Uh, we know that the administration holds a grudge against Facebook and Meta and all of that. And when we talk about NVIDIA, now it includes Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, all of the names that are dependent on NVIDIA and been going higher because of the AI mania. The risk, of course, becomes what happens if we have a trade war. And we will have a trade war. China is a huge source of revenue. And if you're going to block that, add tariffs, and become even more aggressive on exports of really valuable AI technology from NVIDIA, that is probably a national security problem if other countries keep getting their hands on it. What will be the impact against these major companies? It's going to be negative, and that's going to impact the indices negatively, and that, that's going to impact the wealth effect in the economy negatively. You see where that's going? It's a domino. Yet when we talk about the risk of bubbles, it ain't just AI, folks. We're getting headlines reminiscent of 2021. We were talking about the NFT mania and the shit coins, the dit coins. Uh, now, I mean, you listen to this headline, the duct tape banana sells for $6.2 million at an art auction. The buyer, no surprise, a crypto millionaire. Uh, no intelligence needed there. And that leads us, of course, to what's going to happen to cryptos that never been tested under a recession. Bitcoin, that is. Never been tested. Right now, it's going higher because it's a tulip. It's a tool of speculation. It's a tool uh, that acts as a pulse of sentiment. And if we have euphoric sentiment that enables a lot of speculation in the economy and the market, then Bitcoin will reflect that by going higher. There are no fundamentals. There is no utility. So the valuations have no ceiling in Bitcoin. And likewise, has no floor. It can be worth zero or worth a million, depending on the guy next to you. How much are they going to pay for it? But has it ever been tested against a recession? Now, I know folks will say that we're never going to have a recession again. Yes, we will. What do you think Bitcoin is going to do under a recession? That's the ultimate test. And if it fails, we're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars here. That's going to have a major economic impact. Margin calls, you have to divest from stocks to cover your crypto and all of that. But the poster boy of the speculation when it comes to Bitcoin is micro strategy right now. You can look at the action of Bitcoin and not feel uh, concerned or terrified that, hey, this is getting out of control. Because at some point, Bitcoin is going to correct and go down 10, 20 percent, then maybe goes higher again. But when you look at what's going on with micro strategy, you have to shit your pants that this is going to get out of hand. Micro strategy is much doing a Ponzi scheme, which is let's sell more of our shares, worthless shares, that is, use the money to buy Bitcoin. Bitcoin goes higher, shares go higher of micro strategy, sell more, buy more Bitcoin, and the shares go again higher. We sell more, buy more Bitcoin, and it keeps going until something breaks. And when these things break, they break down big. And we got a little taste this week. When MicroStrategy was down, you can look at the chart yourself. You can see a massive red candle. That's just the warning sign to what's about to come. And if MicroStrategy goes down in a big way, it could take down Bitcoin with it, even though Bitcoin might be actually a good holding at this stage. But because of MicroStrategy blowing up, it could take the entire crypto sphere down with it. This is an article by the Wall Street Journal that was published this week, and it reads, MicroStrategy Magical Bitcoin Buying Machine Uses Some Wacky Math. You can read the article for yourself. It's a long one. It'll give you the most important part here. Judging by what the stock market says, a Bitcoin owned by MicroStrategy is worth almost four times as much as Bitcoin owned by an ordinary mortal. Does that make sense to anybody? Why would I pay four times for a Bitcoin that I could buy cheaper? What is so special about Bitcoin owned by MicroStrategy? Nothing. Besides the scam. Anyways, MicroStrategy owned 331,200 Bitcoins as the last count. Worth about $31.2 billion. And had about $4.2 billion in net debt. The software business is not worth much. That's the other thing, by the way. Uh, the company right now is worth over $100 billion, but they, produce, they actually lose money. They produce nothing. How do you think this is going to be resolved? At the end of the day, the company can hold Bitcoin, sure. But is it a software company? If it is a software company, then we're going to go back to profits, revenue. And that's just not going to add up. Anyways, by comparison, its stock market value is $106 billion using the company's recently updated share count. It says it paid about $16.5 billion for the Bitcoin it owns. That is a terrific gain. So the investment $16.5 billion, now the Bitcoin they have worth $31.2 billion. 
So that's a double, right? 100%. That is a terrific gain, but nothing like the 650% increase in MicroStrategy's share price this year. What is so special about the Bitcoin owned by MicroStrategy that I have to pay four times for that Bitcoin when I can buy it for 25% of that cost? Please answer that question to me in the comments section, especially you crypto bros or anybody who's a MicroStrategy pumper. Please explain that. And that is the phenomenon the rising BTC yield reflects. So this is the new phrase, the new scam by drunk Michael Saylor. Uh, the BTC yield. He says, yes, our Bitcoin and MicroStrategy worth more because of BTC yield. Listen to this. That MicroStrategy has succeeded widely at selling stock for irrationally high prices and using the proceeds to buy more Bitcoin, which also keeps soaring, but not as much as MicroStrategy stock has. The company presumably will keep selling overpriced stock as long as investors are eager to buy it. So long as there is a sheep, you can sell more. And at some point, you gotta admire Michael Saylor because this is the second scam that he's pulling out. And this time, he's not gonna miss more of that in a second. But last month, the company announced the goal of raising $42 billion of new capital over the next three years, half of it in equity and half in debt to buy more Bitcoin. This is not gonna end pretty good, folks. Now, this Bitcoin yield bullshit it doesn't tell you how sustainable its strategy, I'm talking about micro strategy here, it doesn't tell you how sustainable its strategy will be or what its holdings are worth. Consider a scenario in which the company kept its share count and Bitcoin holdings unchanged and the price of Bitcoin plunged. You will see crash in micro strategy like you have never seen before in the history of markets, even for a small correction in Bitcoin. Its BTC yield would be zero because its Bitcoin per share would stay the same. But the company's stock price wouldn't stay flat. It would probably plummet. If you want to speculate that Bitcoin is heading higher, buy some. Bingo. Your guess about its future direction might be no better than anyone else's. But at least you'll be paying... This is so stupid, folks. You'll be paying the market price. To go along MicroStrategy stock is to wager that bizarrely inefficient markets will become even more so. And forget about getting a yield. It doesn't pay one. Again, if you like Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. If you think Bitcoin is going higher, buy Bitcoin. But why would you pay four times by owning MicroStrategy? It doesn't make sense at all. It's one of the biggest Ponzi's we're seeing in the market right now. And the thing is, we've seen it before from drunk Michael Saylor. Go back to 1999.com bubble. Here's the chart of MSDR MicroStrategy. The stock rocketed by more than 2,000%. If you think this is crazy that we're seeing right now, you haven't seen anything yet. And then what happened after that? The stock crashed down by 99%. It lost all of its value, almost. Gee, what happened uh, back in the dot-com bubble, the micro strategy? Here's the headline, March 20, 2000. Shares fall more than 60% on earnings revenue statement. Shares of electronic commerce software maker MicroStrategy plummeted Monday, losing more than half of their value in a plunge of 140 bucks after the company said it will restate operating results from the past two years to comply with new federal accounting guidelines on reporting revenue. Oops. In other words, it was fraud back then. The SEC did a probe against MicroStrategy and the stock just plummeted. They faked the revenue and the statements. Everything was fake. We're seeing the same phenomenon right now with Super Micro. That's another company. I'm now suspecting that anything that has micro in it is a scam. Micro penis. That's another one. Think about how many women got scammed throughout the history. But anyways, here's the headline from December 15th, 2000, New York Times. MicroStrategy chairman accused of fraud by the SEC. We're talking about drunk Michael Saylor. This is not the first scam that he's pulling out. But now he found a new generation of donkeys that were babies back then or were not even born. It's easier to scam them with a new one. The SEC, you can stop this and read it for yourself. They find Michael Saylor over $8 million dollars. The Securities and Exchange Commission today brought and settled administrative reporting charges against MicroStrategy. So this is not the first time, folks. And what they're doing right now is even riskier than before. Fraud or no fraud. What is the deal with this Michael Saylor? You go back to 2000 again. He's a cult leader. Even back then, that was one generation of donkeys that got scammed. Now we have a new one. And he always comes with these terminologies. Again, you gotta admire the guy. In the past six months, Saylor, this is back in 2000, has taken to the airwaves to print as a technology avatar. He says he's pioneering a revolutionary business that he calls, quote, telepathic intelligence, end quote. That's the, uh, the scam from last time around. 
Soon Sailor preaches, everyone will be equipped with a wrist chip and tiny earplug. Sailor's computers will process massive amount of data, then tailor it for you. A voice in your ear will caution you not to take that medicine, urge you to sell that stock because it is tumbling, advise you which road to take to avoid traffic. He will turn intelligence into a utility, and he will be its Ford and its Edison. None of that happened. He will also be Education's Carnegie. Last week, Sailor pledged $100 million to launch a free online university. It will collect lectures from the great geniuses of the age. John Williams on composing, Henry Kessinger on Vietnam, and make them available over the internet. This will revolutionize learning by allowing a cab driver in Bombay, India. Sailor says to receive 95% of an Ivy League education, which right now we call Wikipedia. This guy hasn't invented anything that he promised or preached. Nothing. The vaunted telepathic intelligent, quote unquote, is still a dream. All MicroStrategy offers now is a service that warns you if a stock moves dramatically. There is no reason to believe MicroStrategy holds a competitive advantage in this field. Countless companies are battling to control and deliver all the data needed to make telepathic intelligence real. We call telepathic intelligence now AI. It's the same scam. MicroStrategy may be one of the winners. Sailor is tough and smart as any of his competitors, but there is no guarantee. Sailor has been long fascinated with the Roman Empire. He has said he moved MicroStrategy to DC because he liked Washington's Roman architecture. And it is a telling obsession. Anyways, you can read this for your own, but that's enough. Whatever drugs he did in the past, they were pretty good. I mean, Roman Empire, what the hell are we talking about here? These are the same scams from 25 years ago being repackaged and sold to a new generation of donkeys. You go back to Warren Buffett. Be fearful when others are greedy. And be greedy when others are fearful. Right now, greed is rampant. We see greed all over the place. You gotta be fearful. And this is why Warren Buffett is selling like mad. Raising cash like crazy. Now, there are sectors, of course, where we see fears. After all, this is a market of 500 stocks, thousands more in other exchanges. And we see fear in certain corners. That's where you want to be greedy. Specifically when the fear is not warranted. But where we see greed that is not warranted... That is a recipe for a disaster. We go back to the wall of worry. What about the monetary policy? It all ties in together. If we have this mania that's going on in the market right now exacerbated, and we have a tariff war, then at some point the Federal Reserve will not be able to ignore the bond market. They will have to stop cutting rates, if not hike them again. At the end of the day, Jerome Powell is worried about his legacy. He doesn't want to be remembered as the guy who lost inflation. The man is obsessed with Paul Volcker. He wants to be remembered as the new Volcker. And he might do it, since he has a beef with uh, Trump. He might blame the revival of inflation on Trump and become aggressive, become hawkish in the monetary policy if he begins raising rates to control inflation. How do you think the market is going to react with this massive overvaluation that we see? I mean, Powell already said last week that the Fed does not need to be in a hurry in reducing rates. What about the last element in the wall of worry? The Bank of Japan, Japanese yen, none of a concern right now. It evaporated because of the rally in the dollar. Dollar is rallying because of the trade war and because of the inflation revival. But have we eliminated the risk from the Japanese yen and the Bank of Japan? Not really. This is a really good piece that was published this week in Market Watch. The headline reads, Are traders setting the stage for another bruising unwind of the yen carry trade? Question mark. Data shows investors are piling back into bets against the Japanese yen. Uh-oh. The dynamic reminiscent of what preceded the violent reversal that shook global markets in August. This is another piece of evidence that we have lunacy going on right now. You saw what happens in August when we had the carry trade unwinded. You guys going to do it again? And the big caps are already facing problems, regulatory problems, uh, trade war problems, law of large numbers problems. Enjoy the optimism that we have right now, folks. Low trading week, low trading volume, Thanksgiving, got the seasonality, enjoy. But at some point, really soon, you're going to see these elements in the wall of worry flaring up. And we're going to have a different conversation when we see that. But right now, speaking of, why don't we talk about the strategy, at least for this week, maybe for the quarter. Let's see some things, some opportunities that we can invest in or trade at least. I want to show you something here. What you're looking at right now is the daily chart of the IGV. This is the software index. And in yellow, you see the SMH, the semiconductor ETF. We go back 
beginning from July because this was the top in the majority of the technology names. Since then, the IGV software is up over 22%, but chips, on the other hand, semiconductors are down 13%. This is an interesting phenomenon because why do we see chips lagging and then software catching a bit? And that was exacerbated, this gap was exacerbated after the elections. Think about it this way. If we plug in the XLK, this is the big cap technology stocks, Microsoft, Meta, Google, Apple, in the color purple. That's also down. Since July, down about 2%. Why do we see this phenomenon? If you're worried about the regulatory risk from the new upcoming administration, you don't want to be in the XLK because the targets would be the big cap technology companies, the Amazons, the Googles, the matters of the world. Likewise, if you're worried about a trade war, you certainly don't want to be in semiconductors. That's going to be the biggest casualty. But then you look at software. The valuations are not the best, but it's immune from tariffs. And it's been a lagging sector for a long time. It is a sector that still shows growth. And for now, the Fed is still cutting rates, allowing growth to be appreciated. So you think about software as a resort right now to stay in and rotate to out of big cap technology and out of chips. And this is why we see software becoming hot, hot, hot. And this week we got Snowflake's earnings that rocketed higher. Shopify rocketed higher. Every software company that reports, the market realizes, oh, I don't have to worry about tariffs. And oh, by the way, they're still producing enormous growth. So we see this rotation into software. You can go back to the videos that we've done, the charts to watch, which is open there, all members, all viewers. We've done that uh, on the week of my eye surgery. And I showed you this chart right here. IGV, cup and handle. You break above 89.79, you want to be a buyer. Is it a little overboard right now? Is it a little crazy? Yes, in the short term it is. So we might see pullbacks. But I don't think that this dynamic is going to change. That you don't want to assume the risk in semiconductors or the risk in the big caps. You got to migrate to another technology sector. Software becomes a convenient option. You look at some of these charts like Datadog, for example. We covered this chart before it broke out. We said that it might be showing an inverse in the shoulder. Next thing you know, it's lasting higher. Another way to look at it, how about a cup and handle? Is it a little crazy in the short run? Yes, it is. It's overbought. I'm actually betting that it might pull back. But again, I don't think you're going to see a, a, a change in mind all of a sudden where investors say, OK, let's go back to the big caps. Let's go back to the chips. I think the dips will be bought in software. And there is a reason, at least for now, until the Federal Reserve begins to talk about changing the interest rate policy. Adobe is another name we talked about uh, in the charts to watch before it broke out. We talked about a falling wedge. It is trying to break out. That could be another opportunity. Again, cup and handle. Uh, a lot of them are showing this cup and handle pattern. By the way, the ticker HACK Cybersecurity. This is the ETF for cybersecurity. We covered this before. Cup and handle breaks above 68. You want to buy. And you see it breaking out. I think software cybersecurity will continue to be appreciated. The big cap technology stacks and the semiconductors, I don't think so. Then we have another opportunity that we got recently out of fear. Fears of RFK Jr. of the new FDA commissioner and the new upcoming policies from the Trump administration. And we have seen a massive sell-off in high-quality healthcare names. This week, I mean, I said, I made a video saying that this is a silver platter. You gotta at least trade some of these dips. And we bought some shares in Thermo Fisher TMO. You can see this weekly chart right here. It shows you oversold readings outside of the weekly Bollinger Bands. The last two times this happened, we have seen at least a rebound A worthy rebound of trading, if not owning the stock for a little while. I also added another name in my portfolio, Mark. MRK, weekly chart. You see it oversold, got hammered. The obvious reasons, of course. The, the new administration will be tough on big pharmaceutical companies. But I think a lot of the fears are unfounded. Unless you change the pricing, uh, you could talk about policies or, oh, maybe we change the direction of uh, the focus of big pharma and all of that. That's all good talk. But it's not going to impact the bottom line. You talk about pricing, then we're talking about the bottom line. And never mind, of course, the name pays a decent dividend. Another observation, what you're looking at right now is the chart of the QQQ, the NASDAQ, since July. And in white, you have the RSP. This is the equal weight S&P 500. I disclosed recently that in my pension, I shifted from SPY, the S&P 500, to the RSP, the equal weight. And the reason is I'm worried about the big caps. I'm worried about what happens if NVIDIA blows up. And it will at some point because it cannot withstand the law of large numbers. That's going to happen. It's inevitable. In this case, being in the equal weight, while it outperforms right now, and it's been outperforming, the RSP is 11% higher since July. The Qs is flat. 
even if they drop, if there's a crash scenario, because in a pension, you can't really sell. You have to rotate. That's all you can do. You're not going to be damaged as much as had you owned the S&P or the NASDAQ. In the equal weight, you'll perform better because right now we have speculation that oh, Trump is going to be good for industrials or good for the banks or good for this and that. But we see the majority of positivity happening outside of the sphere of big cap technology stocks. You can see it recently. I mean, the RSP, the gap against the SPX, now, this is recent. This is, we're talking about a couple of days. The RSP up about 3%, S&P up one and a half. Now, the other strategy from a trading perspective for this week that we could deploy, again, low trading volume, the path of least resistance is higher, got it. So a lot of you asked about, uh, do I sell credit spreads? The answer is the market maker is ahead of you. The market maker knows that this week is short and it's in the advantage of the seller, not the buyer of options, and specifically the seller of puts. Assuming that nothing big happens, nothing out of the ordinary happen, uh, the market should float its way higher. Generally, it's a good week, uh, but we've seen exceptions before. So you'll see here if you sell the 590 puts on the SPY, for example, and then you buy the 588 for the week, expiration date November 29th, you'll be getting about 50 bucks in credit. Your risk is going to be 450. So the risk versus reward is not pretty good. Now, if we float higher, let's say we have a big pop Monday or Tuesday. I think the opportunity will be in selling credit spreads for the calls, though. And that could be the 600, 605. In, uh, in this case, you'll get a credit of about 85 and risk 415, which is a little better. You can also deploy the Iron Conador strategy. Do both. In this case, you're getting a credit of about 135. Now, of course, the pricing will change Monday. And your max loss is limited to 350. Again, is it a really good risk versus reward? Not really, but it has a high chance of profit, 63% chance that if you do it, you're probably going to capture some credit. A better strategy, to be honest with you, that I'm deploying this week is to exploit the reduction in implied volatility in a low trading week like we have right now. This is upcoming week. I'm going to show you Microsoft as an example. In retrospect, after I did this video, uh, probably Microsoft is not the best example, but you get the idea. Suppose that you think Microsoft will head higher from this point on. In this case, we want to deploy a diagonal strategy because we need to sell options with the expiration date of next week with the assumption that it's going to be a low trading volume, nothing big is going to happen. So it's an opportunity uh, to sell calls, to sell puts, to reduce the value of the main bet that you got for December in this case. So the 420 calls for December, then you sell the 425 for this upcoming week. You're paying about 700 bucks. Suppose that Microsoft indeed goes higher, and let's say trades 420, 425, so your 420 will be in the money. But the 425 expires worthless. Now, after that, you can open the 430, you can sell those on your 420 with the same expiration date in December. And at that point, if, if Microsoft is trading, let's say at 425, 424, you'll be netting a credit of about 400 bucks. And that's going to reduce the entry cost. Remember, it's 700 almost. Knock that down by four. Now you're entering the trade with two bucks and your maximum value that you can pull out of the trade is 10 bucks, which is a really good risk versus reward. In the put scenario, if you think that Microsoft is going to go down, then you probably want to go with the December 410. This is just an example, by the way, the 410 puts. And then you sell the 405 with the expiration date of this upcoming week, November 29th. In this case, you'll pay a little less than the calls because the market maker is now pricing that uh, the seasonality would be good. So the call is more expensive than the puts, which makes them the opportunity. But in this case, you'll be spending about 470. Now, suppose that we have an exception and Microsoft begins to trade down this week and it reaches closer to 410, but it doesn't break below 405. Now you're going to capture the entirety of the credit that you got from the 405. And then after that, you open a debit spread by selling the 400 for December 20 on your 410. Suppose that Microsoft at that point is trading at 409, 407. You'll be able to capture a credit worth about four and a half bucks. Let's call it four to be a little conservative. That we see a 2% or one and a half percent drop in Microsoft. You're probably going to be able to capture 350 to four bucks from selling the 400 puts for December. That's going to reduce your entry cost for the 410, 400 spread for December from 470, the initial cost, to about 70 bucks. If you get the four bucks credit, if you get 350, you probably be a little more, but you get the point. You're reducing the entry cost as much as possible. And then you play the 10 bucks Delta all the way to December. If Microsoft continues to go down, the idea here in a nutshell, exploiting the fact that we have a shortened trading week to open diagonal spreads or credit spreads to reduce an entry cost for a main bet with longer expiration date or to raise cash 
to enter those bets later on after the week expires. We'll talk about this, of course, throughout the week on my Discord, so join us if you'd like. Anyhow, folks, we're going to wrap it up right here because I don't want to keep the videos more than an hour. And then nobody watches. That's going to be a waste of time. But we covered uh, a good amount of coverage here, including the dynamics of next week. Now, we'll do the charting analysis. We'll do all of that in tomorrow's session. So if join us as a member if you'd like. We'll do the full daily coverage in tomorrow's session. But for now, let's wrap it up right here and finish with reviewing the economic calendar for this upcoming week. What do we see here? Monday the 25th, nothing. Probably going to be a good day for the market unless something happens. Geopolitics, etc. Then you got Tuesday the 26th. We get some macro data. So the assumption right now is the dollar or bond yields will be flattish. Nothing is going to happen. No major move. The VIX is probably going to tick down a little bit. And all of that is going to be positive for the market. But if we have something as an outlier from the macroeconomics data, it might impact the dollar and bond yields. And it might impact the stocks that trade based upon these indicators. Uh, if you're looking at the screen right now, remember the technical indicators. We have three markets. We have a market that is traded via the VIX. We have a market traded via the dollar. We have a market traded via bond yields. So keep that in mind. But Tuesday the 26th, we have the Case Chiller Home Price Index, along with consumer confidence, new home sales. And we finish with the minutes from the November FOMC meeting. Comes Wednesday the 27th, this is going to be the heaviest day by far when it comes to macro data because we have initial jobless claims, we have durable goods, we have advanced trade balance in goods, retail inventories, wholesale inventories. We have the first revision of the GDP, then we have the Chicago Business Barometer, and after that comes personal income from the PCE report, the Fed's favorite inflation report. I don't expect something big coming out of this because it is a lagging indicator, but who knows? Concluding the day with pending home sales. Thursday, the 28th, happy Thanksgiving, nothing, we're off, market is closed. Then we come back Friday, November 29th, Black Friday, with a shortened session. And with that, folks, we have reached the conclusion of this video. If you found this coverage informative, helpful, entertaining, please help us out by pressing the like button, subscribing to the channel, leaving us a nice comment in the section below, participating in the conversation, and better yet, join us as a member here on YouTube or Patreon to access the daily coverage and bonus videos. But with that, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Appreciate and love all of you. I'll be talking to you again tomorrow. Good night. Every time I fucking hit refresh, it's dropping, man. It Every always time. goes. Down. And as fun as it is to watch pompous, dumb Wall Streeters be wildly wrong, and you are wrong, sir. I just know that at the end of the day, average people are going to be the ones that are going to have to pay for all of this. Because they always, 32. always do. It's 32. Yeah, it's That's my two cents. Thank you.